You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 85, Old Wine in New Bottles, an interview with Harold Hyman on modern bonding protocols. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Nashville in 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com now to sign up. That's RestorativeDrivenImplants.com. You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 85, Old Wine in New Bottles, an interview with Harold Hyman on modern bonding protocols. And we're live from what looks to be my dad's basement here. <laughs> Maybe right? this is your dad's. I basement. I mean, you guys don't know where we really are, but if you look at the at the if you're looking at this on YouTube, you're probably realizing this is not our typical interview spot or not our typical backdrop, and that's because uh, we're here actually at my office, which is not a place I normally record at. But we got some stuff going on tonight. We're doing some project stuff with the dental guys, and so this was an easy place to record. We kind of knew what we were going to record, but this is an easiest place to do it, and. Wes, well, some exciting stuff going on right now. We want to kind of mm. catch you guys up a little bit on what's been going on in the Dental Guys world. Yeah, what's been going on in the Dental Guys world, we just finished uh, this past weekend Restored Driven Implants Series 1 in Nashville, Tennessee, full class, really had a great time teaching. You yeah. know, I told you before I taught that class um, that morning, I said, you know what? It's like, this isn't my favorite topic maybe to teach on. Um and then I presented. Right. And I stepped out at lunch and I told um, Adam, I said, man, I actually enjoyed it. Right. You were like, I, I, what did I say? I love this topic. I love this topic. No, it's my favorite right. thing to present. It's my favorite thing to present. Yeah. Man, it was a good course. Yeah. RDI Nashville is full. It was actually out. oversold. Actually oversold. Yeah, a few extra people showed up. And um, <clears throat> it, was, it was amazing. And we had a great time. Uh, Jan Bublik did a great job. With surgical principles on day two, but coming up on day or on series two, uh, you and I'll be teaching together, which will be always epic because we have the epic course, duo. Of course, um, bringing it. <laughs> bringing but it. John, tell us about this fall and where we're going. This fall, uh, well, we've got <clears throat> we got a couple things happening. Oh, before the fall though. Yeah, yeah, we got a couple things happening just in the next couple of months. It's going to be because you know really the next couple months for the dental guys. Are super busy. We've got uh, a new um, a new meeting we're going to. We haven't been to before, which mm. we've kind of always talked about going to. It's the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics. And before you moan, actually, if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably ex- as excited as we are about that, or maybe have some intrigue into what that is. That's basically where a ton of really talented, mainly prosthodontists, come to learn some of the newest techniques, collaborate, have some amazing speakers, and we're going to get to be uh, on the show floor um, doing some podcasting mm-hmm. with some really big names that we're going to be able to bring to you. Um, it's it's kind of in flux right now who all we're going to get. We're hoping we get them all but because <laughs> the, some of the speakers that are at this meeting are just epic. Joseph Kahn is going to be there. Yep. Yep. Joseph Kahn. Yep. And Jeff Roush. Jeff Roush. Just go on the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics website yeah. and look at the rundown. Mm-hmm. But we are excited about going there, and it's going to be an amazing time. We want you guys, if you're going to be there, to seek us out. Um, Kettenbach has actually given us their booth right. to to broadcast from. Yeah, they're like building a building onto their booth for us so that we can be podcasting during the day, mm-hmm. <clears throat> kind of live as we go. But our goal it w- would be maybe to podcast with people coming by the booth, but definitely we're gonna be checking out some of the lectures too yeah mainly what we're focused on is trying to trying to uh take some of the lectures if we can we're presenting kind of like we did at spear summit and then bring them in 
and have a discussion a little bit more in depth about some of the things they talked about, really dig into it, ask some good questions and just kind of pick their brain a little bit. Mm. And then, yeah, if some of you guys or girls are going to be over at the meeting, come by the booth, check us out. Um, let's talk, see what you're interested in. Certainly always uh, good to, to get to connect with our listeners. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, right on the heels of that, in a couple of weeks is going to be Academy Boss Integration meeting. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, man. DC. I mean, we're going to be there covering the AO yep. this year from Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. We're taking our live streaming equipment. I mean, dude, we're going to dive in deep, Yep. as we do always. Yep. Um, we the didn't, we never, didn't do it last year. No, we couldn't we did go the, to the meeting. We couldn't go to the meeting, <laughs> yep. but this year we will be there live. And right. Just excited. like always, that was the only meeting that I've missed, the AO meeting in like Long time. 10 years. Long time. So this is great to be back. And um it never disappoints. No. It's always good. It always brings uh, exactly the, the level uh, that you expect. Well, you, people always ask us, like, what organizations that we love to be a part of and what they've given us the, the most of. And that's the meetings that we're going to. Yeah. Right yeah. now in our career, we're going to the meetings that actually give us the most. Yeah. And so if you hear us talk about meetings and you want to get involved in high-level dentistry, well... Just go to the ones we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, these are ones we've kind of boiled down after years of going to a bunch and of meetings. And we're not saying that there's not other meetings out there. No, no. Because we did have an episode last year, and if you haven't watched that, if you're a dental student or a budding clinician, or maybe somebody that's just looking to kind of get take it to the next level, yeah, yeah. cheap but good right. CE, that'll give you some ideas of yep. who to go see at some of these regional yeah, meetings. Yeah, because a couple of weeks later, for instance, you know, I'm taking my team down to the Hinman meeting. That's right, great meeting. Which... You know, uh, you don't always have the same kind of speakers there. It's different right. kinds of speakers. It's more, there's a lot more about team. There's a lot more for hygienists, a lot more for assistants. Some good, though, basic courses and some advanced courses. And that's for always in a great city, Atlanta. Too. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, this is a busy, it's a busy time of, of CE and meetings, but this Fixed Pross meeting, I'm really excited. It's just a couple of weeks away now, so that's mm -hmm. going to be big. And, you know, I, I think that the, a lot of the same people, it's funny. Do you care if I put my arm around you? I mean, I'm a little uncomfortable. Are you? I'm, getting, I'm warming up to it. I'll draw back. I'm warming up. I'll no, it's back. okay. I'm not afraid. Okay, I'm coming in. I'm not afraid. Coming in. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I think a lot of the same people at this American Academy Fixed Pros meeting are the type of people that are kind of where I like at Spear Summit. They're leaders in their area. They're not necessarily doing fixed prosthodontics. They're just leaders in their area, and they're bringing stuff to the same audience. And, you know, one of the people we had the privilege – to get to interview at Spear Summit, and we're going to be bringing you this interview in this episode as Harold Hyman. Oh, man. Kind of like the grandfather, and I, I know disrespect to him, but he has been around with dental bonding, mm -hmm. and he's kind of like the grandfather of bonding. And what I liked about this... Sorry, Harold. He, we didn't mean that in right, a bad way. He, 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 came to the, he came to the table with just cut through the muck, yep. here's what you need to be using, here's what to watch out for. I really liked it. Oh, and yeah. I liked him. Yeah. You know what else I liked about him? He's a fisherman. That's true. He connected with uh, with us on the fly fishing and mm -hmm. has a place in the Tennessee, North Carolina oh, yeah. mountains, you know, right near us. So that was pretty cool. But one of the, one of the things you're going to find from this interview, you know, you might think somebody that's been doing it for, you know, 30 years, 40 years, is going to be old school. Yeah, I thought he would be actually out of touch, to be honest I with did, you. too. I was thinking, well, he's probably going to be, you know, just complaining about, you know, all the fact that things aren't like they used to be. Right. But what I heard from him was this really clear call to make sure that what you're using actually works. Mm. Many companies are experimenting with their products using us as the guinea pigs. Mm. Um, I also heard a lot about how technology has not advanced a whole lot in no. bonding in the last probably 15 years, and that uh, still there are tried and true principles that we can't skip, we can't we can't eliminate. I steps. think there's some warnings in this. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some like confirmation to me right. that we're still doing it right. Yeah, and that I think there's also some caution about what's coming. Yeah. I think there's also some caution about what we should be doing with our composites. Yes, definitely. And what should we expect from our composite? He makes some key statements in there. I want you to listen for those yeah. about bonding to enamel and yep. bonding to teeth, period. And long-term bond, long bond stability. long-term bond stability. I think that the key thing for anybody who's listening to this 
is they want to know in the end what bonding agent should yeah, I use, right? I'll, Everybody's yeah. like, cut to the chase, what bonding? And I'll guarantee you that you will know the answer to that question. Maybe not a brand, because that's not the if point. If you don't know at the end of this, then just message us. Right, then just send us a message, because you should be able to very clearly see through what uh, Harold says what we should be looking for in a bonding agent. Mm. And for me, it was really great, because it kind of confirmed that, okay, I'm doing... The right thing, and, and saying, some confirmation. of the yeah, right. and some of the things that you know are new are interesting, and we need to be looking at them. But but then there's also some things you just have to you have to keep in mind that you can't yet change in, in your practice. You you have to be consistent, and sometimes the products that are tried and true are the ones that are still the best. I tell you what, bonding is probably the hardest thing we do in our practice. Yeah, it's very technique sensitive, and I was honored to have a dental giant like Harold Hyman on our podcast, especially someone that is as good a friend to Frank Spear as we found out. I did not know that they were this close, yeah. but they really have been friends for a lifetime. Right. And because of that, they have helped each other become better clinicians. And, yeah. um, and he speaks to that um, both at Spear Education, whenever Frank has him speak at uh, Spear Summit, mm-hmm. and he speaks to that in this podcast. So I hope you enjoy after this word from our sponsor, Harold Hyman. This is Justin Goodbrand, and here is today's tip. By now, you should have your strategic plan completed. As you share your vision, be sure your goals for the upcoming year and next three to five years are simple and clear. This vision will show your team a path to success, not just the company's success, but each individual's success too. Will there be pay increases, job title adjustments, more responsibility? No matter the methods, everyone needs to be on your path. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak to a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is an investment advisor representative of Heritage Investors, a registered investment advisor. Visit heritageinvestor.com or financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. We are live from the Spear Summit in Scottsdale, Arizona, and welcome Wes, this is an exciting day super for, the, for us. Excited. We're super pumped. Yeah, and and you know, there's really I don't know that there's a better person to kind of kick off this uh, this time we have uh, than Dr. Harold Hyman. So why don't you why don't you introduce uh, Dr. Hyman to us? Well, first of all, you Dr. Harold Hyman comes from an area close to home for us. Yeah. We were just kind of chit chatting before we started here, and you were talking about uh, fly fishing and growing up. Um, and being around uh, the Boone, North Carolina area. Exactly. You guys, uh, John went to App State, you went to App State. My grandparents retired to that area, so that's really cool. But yep. a, a meeting that John and I have really dove into over the years was the Thomas P. Hinman meeting yep. in Atlanta, and you um, are distinguished professor of operative dentistry at the, um, at the University of North Carolina and you you helped out with the Thomas P. Hinman meeting as well. So that's pretty sweet. Tell me yeah, a little bit about that. The Hinman meeting is, uh, I think, one of the best dental meetings in the country. It's a very prestigious meeting, and I've been blessed to have been a featured speaker there oh, over the last 30 years, uh, uh-huh. about every other year. And um, uh, I was honored to be the first distinguished professor at mm-hmm. UNC, the Hinman distinguished professor. Uh, of course, I've cut back now and... Uh, and uh, I'm teaching part time now, so so you can fly fish more. That's right. Hopefully, spend <laughs> more time in the outdoors in God's country up around. There you uh, go. There you go. Blowing rock. That's awesome. Well, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to have a little chat with you is um, you have published more than 200 scientific publications, and one of your fortes is a, is about bonding and composites and really what a lot of dentists are doing on a day in day out basis and you're going to be lecturing here um, at the Spear Summit this year tell us a little bit about your lecture and then we'll follow up with some maybe some questions okay you know I've been very blessed Uh, I was fortunate enough to join a department that had probably the first clinical research program of its kind in the country and consequently the very first clinical trials on posterior composites were conducted at the University of North Carolina Uh, We had a really strong team of researchers in our department doing clinical trials on adhesive systems and so forth. And my philosophy is there's way too much information disseminated based on anecdote, opinion, and hype 
uh, or mm. whoever happens to be patting uh, the You're on the right show, my friend. Wallet at the time. <laughs> yes. And not necessarily good science. And, mm. you know, the clinical trials we conducted were then translated into our educational curriculum. Uh, it also resulted in our publishing the number one selling dental textbook in the world, uh, Sturdivant's Art and Science of Operative Dentistry. And again, uh, our philosophy was that uh, we needed to substantiate the information that we teach and we share with students with good science. Mm. And so these clinical trials have really complemented our teaching program. So just wanted to give credit where credit is due. I've been very fortunate to be part of a very good research team. and. In the lecture I'm going to present, I'm trying to translate the research piece into everyday application. Okay. You know, trying to use this knowledge in the context of its application so that dentists can place posterior composites that are going to last. Mm -hmm. And so my focus is going to be what are the critical factors for longevity of posterior composites? How can we avoid critical errors? What can we do to ensure long-term longevity of restorations? And also, how can we deal with issues like sensitivity mm -hmm. or establishing good proximal contacts, uh, these types of things? And again, all the while trying to substantiate this with good research. This is good. Yeah, and I and I, I want to dive right into some of the the questions that we've we've kind of put together because it really flows right into what you'd be be talking about. I want to kind of focus. Um, on maybe three or four different broad areas, but, but talking a little bit first about composite materials and some of the newer composite materials that have been released over the last five to ten years. Sure. Uh, there's been a focus uh, on bulk fill systems and starting with more bulk fill flowables uh, and then progressing to bulk fill final restorations or, or you know that you don't have to place a, a hybrid layer over. Sure. You, can, you can place directly in, in one increment what are your thoughts about the current state of, of the science there uh, with things like uh, wear characteristics, sure. polishability, uh, you know, the, the depth of cure. Margin ad ad adaptation, adaptation yeah. you know, working time, I feel yeah. like sometimes. Do you, is, yeah, you know. do you think we're at a point where the materials uh, are, are truly doing what the companies are saying that they should do or that we should still be living in a world of two millimeter increments and uh, yeah. using our nano hybrids and uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well first of all we've got to teach what we know works not what we think or hope works and by that I mean mm. you've, you've got to take some of the newer developments with a grain of salt because again the proof's in the proverbial pudding so to say and you've got to have clinical trials to validate these newer formulations. Having said that, you know, there have been some interesting new bulk fill flowable bases. For example, I don't know if I can mention product names. But uh, yeah, like, that's fine. You know, SureFill SDR has received a lot of notoriety, and it, it, it runs counter to what we've been told in that we shouldn't use increments more than two millimeters because of polymerization shrinkage concerns. Right. But as it turns out, with flowable materials, since they are not very heavily filled, their elastic modulus actually can mitigate the polymerization shrinkage concerns. Uh, so <clears throat> you can place a large amount of this material uh, as a space filler, if you will, in a larger preparation. However, it does not have favorable wear characteristics since there is so much resin, so consequently it needs to be veneered or overlaid with a material that is more of a restorative type of composite that exhibits wear characteristics that will resist proximal and occlusal wear. Yes. But, but the truth is, yeah, it's like putting a big marshmallow in the prep, you know, the, these materials have the capacity to be so elastic that typical polymerization concerns that would result in bond dislodgement or whatever uh, are, are rendered moot. Hmm. But my fear is that some dentists think, oh, I can just fill this whole prep up with a material that actually is intended, as it says on the box, as a base, hmm. not a restorative. So the next step is then, we need a bulk fill restorative, one that also can be cured four or five millimeters deep, but also which has the capacity to be wear resistant mm -hmm. and provide the qualities you want in a final restoration, not just a base. Right. And there's some materials that are coming out. Uh, there's a new bulk fill material from 3M that mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about that actually has a very, very um, innovative 
polymerization system in that there are monomers in there that actually will expand during the typical contraction sequence of mm. polymerization. So they're counteracting. That's right. It reminds so you, us of like the Silurane chemistry exactly idea, right? right. Yep. 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 It's, it's a compensating expansion, if you will, in it to negate the effects of the polymerization shrinkage. Now, I'm not a chemist. I'm more interested in the clinical trials. UNC is doing clinical trials of this material. Uh, are we ready to put it in our clinic? Not necessarily because, again, we want to have good validation. Data, yeah. But it's that kind of promising research that results in material that can be cured four or five millimeters deep but can be also placed in, in increments, you know, exceed, exceeding three, four millimeters. And, of course, in a practice, time is money. If you can place a material without adverse effects in right. those types of increments, that, that's a big deal. Yes. And there are other materials like DMG has one called Ecosite that's just come out that's being uh, researched, getting ready to do clinical trials. Um, and there are others. You know, Sonic Phil uh, has the capacity to be cured four to five millimeters deep. I don't know that they still have. I still think it, that material, for example, still has polymerization shrinkage concerns. So if I were going to place that in a high C factor prep like a class one, uh, it's like I've told folks, you know, you don't suspend the laws of physics just because you can bulk fill something. Right, right. It's got to be inherent in the formulation of the material to be able to do so. And so I would probably still use something like sonic fill very very good material that gives you good marginal adaptation but in a class one i would not exceed two millimeter increments I see. Uh, simply because again you got to be concerned about c-factor concerns and bond disruption yeah mm -hmm. so you That's feel good. that that uh, you know and i i, I don't want to go all, too far off on this rabbit trail but it's interesting you mentioned clinical trials you know that that need to be done and it seems like we're always chasing that because products are being released no and doubt. then we, the dentist, the clinical dentist, oftentimes are the guinea pig. We are testing, we are doing clinical trials on our patients versus having, you know, institutional clinical trials that are, that have, and I understand from the industry standpoint, it's a challenge. Uh, do you think that, uh, do you think that, how do you think that's going? Do you think that's getting to be more of a problem as maybe funding is more of a challenge? Or do you think that that is something that still is, is being done well at this point? Oh, man, you hit a topic near and dear to my heart. Okay. Um, the, mis the most misused term in dentistry is that a material looks promising. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I can cite for you many, many, many materials that looked promising that turned out to be pure crap. Mm. And so I guess what I try to emphasize to dentists is you've got to be discriminating dental consumers. Yes. Speakers in particular are in a position of influence, undue influence. And yet I would hold speakers' feet to the fire, and if they recommend something, say, well, that sounds great, but can you provide me with some clinical trials? Yes. Because otherwise it's exactly what you just said. The dentist and their patients become the field for testing, mm. and if it doesn't work, is the manufacturer going to refund you for all exactly. of the failed restorations? Exactly. Not likely. So we have to be very discriminating dental consumers. My philosophy is if it's been out for more than three years, likely the material is probably an acceptable material. because. You know, even in the absence of clinical trials, the tincture of time is a pretty mm -hmm. good test for a lot mm -hmm. of these materials. Better yet, it's nice to have clinical trials, but you're absolutely correct. Most new materials appear on the market before the clinical trials even commence. Yes. That's important for our listeners to really understand. And, yes. Yeah. You know, and that's why I say we talk about things that look promising. Yes. Uh, and I've given examples of some new materials that look promising. And judging by the track record of some of the manufacturers, you know, I have a high degree of confidence in some of these materials, but I don't think it's responsible, for example, as an academician, for us to introduce a material that has not been adequately tested or has gone under the rigors of clinical trials. Yes. You know, ultimately, you've got to show the stuff works in the context of its application. You know, how something bonds to a cow tooth on a bench top has very little clinical predictive value. How something looks in a wear test in a tooth brushing machine, that's well and good, but in the mouth it faces a whole different set of covariables. So I can't overemphasize the 
the importance of being a discriminating dental consumer. Don't jump on the bandwagon just based on someone's recommendation. Wait till the proof is in, so to say. <clears throat> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm -hmm. Use what has been working for you until you know that this given material has actually shown uh, to be a good material. So mm -hmm. when we, we, we were talking about this on the plane ride over here, and the discussion came up that we're replacing amalgams that, in, in John and I's our opinion is, is that, that have been in the mouth 30, 40 years. Right. And they still have, that, that's amazing. It is. And as my dental materials uh, <clears throat> professor said, he said, Wes, it's amazing that anything works in the mouth because of all the co-variables you mentioned. So what can we do to help our composites perform? Yeah. So talk to some of that. Yeah. Well, first thing I want to tell you is, do we still teach dental amalgam? The answer is yes. Uh, I can tell you the irony when it comes to safety concerns, if I really wanted to vilify material and scare them with regards to, to potential hazards or components in composition, I could do a hell of a lot better job with composites. Than I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. I agree. That's yeah. the ir irony to me. Right. Safety concerns aside, though, most patients want white fillings is the bottom line for aesthetic reasons and consequently we spend the the predominant amount of time in our curriculum on teaching posterior composites i can take a c student and generate a pretty good amalgam i can't take a c student and consistently produce an acceptable composite mm, mm. that's great it, ta it takes an a minus uh, a student to consistently generate well done, acceptable posterior composites. So first thing we've got to recognize is there's a higher level of technical proficiency required to place a good posterior composite. And <clears throat> then it becomes a matter of trying to optimize the seal that we can get in that restoration. Mm. And there's been a lot of good research that shows that majority of breakdown with class two posterior composites is due to gap formation. Mm. Now gap formation could be along gingival margins due to just poor adaptation, polymerization shrinkage concerns, under curing so that over time the material degrades and invites bacteria. But gap formation is critical, and as, as Tom Hilton has pointed out at University of Oregon, it's not necessarily the size of the gap, it's just the presence of the gap. Mm. You know, so our primary focus is to improve marginal adaptation so that we can seal the margins and render them immune to you know, recurrent carries from, from penetration. Now, as soon as you lose enamel on that gingival floor, all bets are off. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna be talking about uh, bioactive materials, and, and truth is, I believe in the future, within the next five years, a, a bioactive material, like a calcium silicate, calcium oxide, some type of, of cement, will probably supplant resin-based materials. Mm because in the absence of enamel, these materials still render a good bond. Yes. Many of them also release uh, ions of you know, phosphate calcium or fluoride or whatever to help create a zonal caries inhibition and are largely immune to contamination effects from moisture. So I really think you're gonna probably see some type of bioactive material, some cement as we know it today, that will be developed that will probably supplant the resin-based materials that we have because uh, of their ability to resist leakage mm -hmm. and of course that. Yeah, because we had that hope, I think, or that discussion years ago with uh, open sandwich technique and That's glass right. alanomer, and then it became, well, let's talk about maybe MMP inhibition with, mm -hmm. you know, benzalkonium chloride mm -hmm. and, and with uh, chlorhexidine, and right. it's, it sounds like now the, uh, the shift is, is maybe away from resin completely yeah. uh, and not like you say not not we're not there yet but but it's coming and I want to want to go to I want to focus on maybe one thing that you that you'd said about marginal adaptation and that is just because I know it's such a hot topic and our listeners are interested it is with bonding agents sure. because we know that uh, if there's any area that has been maybe the most confused and the most overhyped and overmarketed and so many failed products that have had been promising it's maybe been in the world of bonding over the years 
And, uh, you know, there's been discussion, especially over the last few years, about universal bonding agents. And, you know, there's been different words that have been used to, to describe what that means. It doesn't necessarily mean the number of bottles. It doesn't necessarily mean exactly what's in them. Uh, how simplified can we get with bonding, or should that even be the discussion that we're having about bonding agents? Where do you think we are now with that? Oh, that's a great question, and that's one, again, near and dear to my heart. Um, in my opinion, we literally went backwards for probably 15-plus years in the development of adhesives. Uh, again, time is money. If you can develop a material that in one application will bond both to enamel and dent, and of course that's going to have appeal. So self-etching adhesives became very, very popular. But I'm here to tell you there is only one key to success, and that is your ability to etch and bond to the peripheral enamel. Mm. And that requires the application of phosphoric acid. Mm. So with the advent of universal materials, I will tell you that um, probably one of the best articles I saw was one of from Dave Pashley's group where it says, old wine in new bottles. Okay. <laughs> there, is no, there is no breakthrough technology in universal adhesives. Now granted, they have recognized the merits of additives like MDP monomer. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. MDP monomer was the magic bullet, or is the magic bullet in SE bond, and to our surprise in clinical trials, it's done very, very well. So a lot of manufacturers have incorporated MDP monomer, monomer or something like that to help create better bonds uh, to, to structure. So there have been improvements, I don't mean to belittle that, but the truth is the biggest difference with this new, uh, this new category of quote universal materials is that somebody must have slapped manufacturers upside the head and made them realize that the key to success here is the peripheral bond to enamel. Mm -hmm. So now if you look, almost every manufacturer recommends that their materials be used with either a selective etch right, of right. the enamel periphery or a total etch both of which are going to obtain the seal needed for a successful restoration. I'm here to tell you the bonds to enamel are essential. Mm. The bonds to dentin are gravy. Mm. Okay, I like to get bonds to dentin, but you don't, as we did for years, emphasize with a self-etched material that the bond to dentin is so important that you can ignore the key to success, which is the bond to enamel. Right. And we know that because of the lower acidity of these self-etched materials, they did a very mediocre job, right. if not an inadequate job, of bonding to the very substrate that we have to get a good bond to, and that's the enamel. So mm. still the gold standard is a three three or two step solution. That's exactly right. Yeah. As long as you interject an enamel etching step, whether it be selective etch or total etch, mm -hmm. you're going to be golden. Now you still got to consider you know, post-op sensitivity issues. Now relative to the name universal, as soon as you start adding components like MDP monomer, now you have the capacity of this material to bond to enamel, dentin, resin, and as we know, MDP monomer facilitates bonds to zirconia. Mm -hmm. uh, some companies even incorporate uh, materials that will bond to other types of substrates mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. porcelain uh, in that they put silane Silence, in. Right. So you know, now it becomes universal purely by the range of options you have and the substrates to which you can bond. Right. But as Pashley put it, it's basically old wine and new bottles. When it comes to dent and bonding, there really isn't anything significantly different. The biggest difference is the attitude of the manufacturers in recognizing that you've got to use selective or total edge. Mm. And you know, when they first came out with these, they weren't no, really saying that. No, not at all. That. They no. weren't saying no. that. And, that. and again, mm. you know, that's a manufacturer. Again, you have to kind of look at it in the light of a researcher or at as a dental product mind, yep. you know, as a, I'm a consumer here, you that's know, and exactly I'm actually right. using this product. I wonder... If we could talk a little bit about, we keep talking about marginal adaptation, sure. and there's some little keys and pearls that you have that might be able to help some of our listeners out about how they can better adapt their filling material to in a class two situation, or sure. even even adapting it in an occlusal situation. How, what would be your recommendations? Well, you know, ironically, uh, when poster composites first came about, manufacturers made an attempt to create materials that had a resistance to 
placing or packing that was similar to amalgam. They wanted to appeal to the dentist's familiarity with the, with the placement feel, if you will, of an amalgam. Mm -hmm. Consequently, we had a lot of, quote, packable composites. Mm -hmm. Some of those packable composites were so dry in our clinical trials, we literally had to burnish margins with a, with a ball burnish with bonding agent on it because you could not get great adaptation. And as I mentioned, adaptation is critical. So since that time, I think folks have begun to focus more and more on how can you either place a small amount of a material that has a favorable viscosity like flowable composites placed very sparingly along the marginal interface purely to facilitate good adaptation or create a composite that through heat or vibration assumes a flowable consistency so that it can also adapt to those margins without void or gap formation. So, I think it all really relates to the, the viscosity of your restorative material uh, when it comes to optimal adaptation, I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and so you feel at this point that uh, the, the material science, as, as far as you're concerned, it sounds like is more, from, from a resin composite standpoint, focused on how can we accomplish a flowable consistency uh, or, or easier uh, placement than it is really about uh, a lot of these other, again, the failures that you mentioned at the beginning is mainly because of gap formation. That's exactly So right. the bonding material that we use or the adhesive we use is more about, it's, it's simple. It's really just if you're etching and you're using a, a system that, is, that is, includes selective or total etch, and, and then you're using a composite that is uh, able to either be uh, flowable through, its, uh, through heating or through vibration. This is sort of where you feel the state of the art is now for, for and, and of course there's many other ingredients, right, curing, right. matrix systems, but is that an accurate uh, way of putting it? Absolutely. Okay. And, and the addition of flowable composite, let me emphasize, um, flowable composites inherently are inferior composites, let's face it. Mm. These, the, they're flowable because they have less filler content, they have much more resin. Mm -hmm. So in our attempt to facilitate better adaptation, if we use a material like a flowable composite, we want to use it sparingly, realizing it doesn't have favorable physical properties for the entire restoration. We're just trying to create an interface that is going to be well sealed. So you can put a little small amount and tease it around with an explorer, or you can even put it in there and pack your first increment of composite into it displacing the excess flowable, it's called a snowplow mm -hmm, technique. Mm -hmm. Both approaches work, both have been researched and show improvement in, uh, in marginal adaptation. But <clears throat> the option is to either use a very small amount of flowable or make your restorative in a transient manner flowable through heat or vibration like this. I think that's gotcha. awesome. Let's talk a little bit about curing. Yeah, that's what I was going uh, next. Because I think that that, you know, naturally flows into that discussion is, you know, once you've got this well-adapted composite, uh, we now have to cure this composite. That's and right. uh, now uh, there's, again, another area that's been very uh, controversial over the years as to you know, how should we cure, how long should we cure, what's the proper, you know, pulse technique, what's the proper light that we need to be using. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you think we need to be sure. at this point today. Well, categorically, manufacturer recommendations for cure times have been underestimated. Most estimate uh, five seconds for with contemporary blue LEDs for two millimeters. And you got to consider the fact that when manufacturers are conducting depth of cure tests, they're doing it with the light guide right smack dab on top of a sample of composite. Well, that just doesn't happen clinically unless you're doing a class five on a central. You got cuss tests, you got matrix bands. There are going to be distance effects, particularly a class two where the gingival floor could be 10 millimeters from your light source. <clears throat> right. So, you know, by the law of squares, you've got to consider the fact that light intensity decreases as a function of distance. What I've always told folks is when in doubt, cure longer. Mm -hmm. You cannot over cure composite, but you can dang sure under cure it. Mm -hmm. So when in doubt, cure longer. And most research shows that it should be 10 seconds per two millimeter increment to be on the safe side. And there are other, you know, co-variables that relate to this, including the type of composite. Microfills tend to disperse the light more than macrofills or hybrids. Uh, darker shades tend to obscure the light more than lighter shades. Type of filler, you know, 
relates to the refractive index and the ability to cure more deeply. Mm -hmm. So there are co-variables there, but just mm -hmm. as a general rule, 10 seconds per two millimeter increment is a good rule of thumb. And as you get away from the light, increase that time accordingly so that you cure it properly. Mm -hmm. The second consideration is the angulation. Mm -hmm. If you're angled too much from the mesial or distal, you're gonna shadow the very part that is going to be the most critical to cure, and that's along the gingival floor, the margin along the gingival floor. So we have to be very, very concerned about aligning the light in the path of the proximal box in particular with a class two to ensure that we actually cure the very most critical parts. And then after taking off the matrix band, we teach our students to do a post cure. Right. By that I mean pr projecting the light towards the gingival floor, both from the facial and the lingual. Because mm -hmm. again, you can't over cure it, but you, uh, you certainly want to make sure that you get an adequate cure. Yep. So yeah, light curing is one of those pieces that rel relates to uh, ultimately gap formation through degradation of uncured composite. Mm. I'm certainly not advocating people go on eBay and purchase um, a curing light or some maybe generic, you know, 10 or $15 light off of Amazon. But can you speak, because I, but I see a lot of people maybe buying LED curing lamps and using those in their in their practice these days versus maybe using something that's been validated and continually tested. What do you what do you feel like right now? I don't I don't you don't have to speak to brands, mm -hmm. but what makes a curing light a good curing light and how do we continually validate? Yeah. Because I have a curing light it's a you know in my practice and and I, it has a little thing to test it on it. You know, we, we, we test it every day to make sure it's working properly, the tip's not, you know, right. broken in some way. What should we be doing and what should we be looking for? And is there some validity to something that is off of Amazon? You know, <clears throat> the best way to ensure that your light has sufficient output is actually to have a radiometer. And, and the radiometers that we used for quartz halogen lights are different from the radiometers that are needed to measure the output of a, a blue LED light. You don't necessarily have to buy one. You know, I would, you could ask your rep, yep. uh, sales rep, uh, could you bring in a radiometer? Uh, and they'd gladly check the lights. Uh, we have to do it in our student clinics. It's always appalling to see how some of the lights wouldn't have the output of an ever-ready flashlight, and yet we've still got students in there that are, right. you know, placing restorations every day. So, yeah, it's a very uh, critical consideration to make sure that the light uh, has ample output, otherwise you're not going to be able to get uh, reliably cured composites. Uh, brand isn't as as important as uh, just validating what the output is mm -hmm. to begin with. That's, yeah. that's a good point. What do you think about dual cure composites? There's been some some discussion about those, of course, for it's not a, not a new thing in, right. in dentistry, but there's been discussion about uh, polymerization shrinkage and cure depth. Uh, and, you know, along with these bulk fill light cure composites, there have been more bulk fill dual cure composites that have come yeah. on. What, what, what are your thoughts on those and how do they fit in? Well, twofold. Number one, um, you've got to consider compatibility with your bonding agent. Mm. The vast majority of bonding agents or adhesives available today are not compatible with a self-cured resin. And the reason is that, for example, all the self-etched materials are inherently acidic. If that acidic primer comes in contact with a self-cured resin, it will scavenge the tertiary amines and render it um, ineffective. You yeah. won't have a bond at that interface. Now, if with a dual-cured material you have adequate light to penetrate the full distance to the bonding interface, then you're golden. Mm -hmm. you know, as long mm -hmm. as you can rely on the light cure, you're fine. But if there are shadowed areas where you clearly are relying on the dual cured component, then you have to make doggone sure that your bonding agent is indeed compatible. The old multi-bottle systems that ended with an unfilled resin adhesive are compatible because that coat covered the acidic primer. Mm -hmm. And there are a few, uh, and if you look for example in uh, uh, many of the new universal materials, they have optional right. dual cure activators. Right, activators. And what those do is create a degree of compatibility with the self-cure uh, component in a dual cured resin. But the bottom line is, in no study I've ever seen does the self-curing component of a dual cure material exceed the bond strength of what you get with light curing. Okay. So light curing is always going to be the better of the two bonds. 
I guess it's kind of a backup, if you will, mm-hmm. that in the event the light does not uh, uh, penetrate to the depth of the bonding interface, then yes, it's good to have a dual cured material. Yeah. But um, but if you know that the light cure is necessary anyway for the best bond strength and the yeah. best longevity, then we, we should be thinking all the same things anyway in no terms doubt. of how we design our preparation, the curing light, and so it. And when you look at these that often come in these big big pace pace syringes mm-hmm. or you know giant guns for dispensing them it it's not quite as easy to use that no. that's for that's for sure and I, I want to maybe change the, the subject here just as we kind of start closing in on the end of this uh, time because we're going to be moving into the summit um, you know our listeners we're, we talk a lot about uh, and we maybe lament on our show that people don't go to meetings as much as they maybe yeah. should have. And here we are at this meeting and uh, surrounded by some very high-level folks that are talking about some high-level topics. I wonder, um, who, who are some of the people that you think our listeners should be going to see to talk about composites and talk about bonding? Uh, you know, Give us some ideas of, if somebody wants to learn more about this, we feel very strongly that you know, dentists, we need to be experts at this topic. Uh, yeah. who, should we, who are some people that we need to be seeing? Well, uh, you're asking someone who's very biased uh, because, <laughs> uh, and it's not because I'm speaking here, but uh, I've been in academics for 41 years. And in my opinion, uh, there are two types of CE courses. There are the show and tellers, of which the majority fall into that category, and there are the teachers. Mm. I have never known two more exemplary teachers than Frank Spear and Vince Kokich. Mm. They follow, now when I got my master's in education, I focused on what are the keys in adult and higher education. I looked at andragogical concepts, that kind of stuff. But I will tell you, the four research proven keys to a good teacher. Number one, cognitively well organized. Number two, mastery of the subject matter. Number three, ability to establish warm relationships not contaminated by arrogance, for example. Mm. Number four, indirectness, being mm. a facilitator, not a spoon feeder. Mm. And if you look if you look at a Frank Spear, a John Coyce, uh, and when Vince was alive, Vince was just the epitome of a good teacher. They exemplify the research proven characteristics of an effective teacher. Mm. So when my graduates graduate and they say, Dr. Hyman, where should I consider going to get additional education? Spear Institute is absolutely number one because I know Frank Spear is number one, highly ethical. You're not coming out here to learn to teach, just I mean, learn to make money. It's not, you know, it, the philosophy here is do what's best for your patient, not what's best for your wallet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and in my opinion, clinical excellence is the best marketing tool of all. That's mm. exactly right. Mm. And, and I can tell yep. you, you know, I just, I know the faculty with the Spear Institute. I know the curriculum involved with the Spear Institute. I know the models that they have created. I know they appeal to different types of learning strategies because a lot of the millennials want to have it packaged online. And my goodness, the Spear Institute has a phenomenal uh, volume of material online, which appeals to a lot of younger dentists. And yet, I don't think there's any substitute for the networking and the inner interchange of ideas and so forth than at a meeting like this. And yeah. that's why I, I'm just um, I'm always really excited to participate in in a Spear meeting like this 10-year summit because the people here are here to learn. Yes. They're enthusiastic. Uh, they aspire to excellence or they wouldn't be part of the Spear model. Yes. So, you know, am I biased? Yes. Are there other good teaching institutes? Yes. John Coyce has a very, very good teaching institute. Panky historically has also married the clinical with life values mm-hmm. component, which mm-hmm. I think is an important consideration. Um, but th- those are the ones that really come to mind. The reason I speak more to the Spear Institute is just because I, I know Frank. He's been a dear friend of mine for 32 years, and uh, 
I know there's a no better teacher slash ethical mm-hmm. person in the pursuit of excellence than, than Frank, and it's reflected. It's the hallmark of this institute. So. Yeah, and I, and I think your your point is so well taken that you know we we have so many times spoken to younger dentists who are or or, or older dentists who are looking to uh, you know well, what what do I need to do next? And, and they're always they seem to think that there's a magic marketing solution there's a magic bullet to 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 be able to to do well Mm -hmm. and and we just completely agree that there is nothing that you can do that will match being a master at what you do and and when you do well uh, with your dentistry and you do well with your patients um, it's very hard for me to see examples of people that are masters at their at their dentistry that are not doing incredibly well even if you look at it from a financial standpoint even if that's your focus you get great at dentistry that that usually comes along with it but you sure do sleep well at night you know so I, yep. I think it's a point well taken for any young or old dentist who's looking to you know take their skills to the next level or their business even to the next that's level right. this is how you do it it's the basics. It's the basics. Patients are not stupid. They know when they are being cared for <clears throat> well, they can differentiate between mediocrity and excellence. And uh, so that, that's what, it's a nice to be associated with an organization that has a commitment, a true commitment to clinical excellence. You know, John and I, whenever we, before we even started podcasting three years ago, <clears throat> that we, we saw that we wanted people to to hear exactly what you just said is that there is no substitute for finding somebody that is passionate that has integrity that teaches with this these four things that you mentioned Mm. and 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 I I remember John and I having a conversation like you know we're gonna choose to go to Spear Education this might sound like a commercial Mm. you know we're not getting paid to say this you know we're here get an opportunity yeah, we're here to, to listen to the, here same, to listen speakers. To the same speakers they <laughs> are we just get it right. we just get to record this and and i think that you know it, it is exciting whenever you do excellent dentistry and you're trying to research and the patient does notice mm-hmm. and i think that there's so much of a push for efficiency but sometimes efficiency the one bottle system or the one thing one bond to rule them all as right, we talked about right, in the previous right. episode that you know it may not be the right call yeah. and 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 always pay homage to the old things that we've known in the past that old wine and new bottle it really does sometimes come back to what we knew years ago that's exactly that's right. right but we have to think okay let's be forward thinking a little bit here but let's not forget where we came from and what we know yeah well we really appreciate it's your time oh, uh, coming on and, and talking with us uh, this has been a, a great kickoff to what we're looking forward to being an excellent few days here out at uh, out at Spear Education and uh, we really appreciate what you're doing and uh, we're glad to know too that uh, you know uh, you're just around the corner from us uh, right. fly if they may see you on fly fishing one of these yes. days. Awesome, <laughs> Thank you again, Dr. Hyman, for being on us. And for, uh, for those listening and watching, it's been a great episode. We look forward to catching up with you again soon on The Dental Guys. Well, as you're coming back from the interview from Harold Hyman, John, what a great interview again. And we really appreciate uh, Spear Education and them giving us access to great clinicians like this. Yeah. Hey, if you want more stuff like this or you want to tell us what it meant to you, Head over to Facebook, like us on Facebook, send us a message. Also, Twitter, John, at The Dental Guys. Yep. And we're even on Instagram now. You can message us that way. We really appreciate people that follow us that way. We appreciate the feedback. We're always looking to actually take our podcast to the next level right. and do what you guys want us to um, to do, which is present high-quality dentistry, high-quality clinicians, and what they're doing in their practice. I um, also want to say is that if you are interested in learning more about dental implant placement in your practice, um, head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com right now and look for the new course. Uh, we're going to be going to Iowa. That's right. And in, the in, in the fall, we'll be in Iowa. Yeah. And we, uh, we've, been, we've been having such great success with this course. We've started taking it on the road this last year, and so far it's been very, very successful and we've got a great group already that we know about in Iowa who's kind of anticipating us coming. There's one of the reasons that we, we went there is because we have had yeah, this call from people mm-hmm. there. And, uh, you know, one of the things you're going to learn at RDI is you're going to learn a predictable, systematic, research-based way 
to place and restore dental implants. We're going to teach you uh, the same types of things we do in our practice every single day. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, you know, some crazy fancy thing. It's a system that works. That's what everyone wants. You guys know if you've listened to the show, that's what we're about. So if you want to learn how the dental guys do it in their practice, uh, restorativedrivenimplants.com. Go over there, check it out, sign up, send us messages if you have questions about what exactly it is. Uh, but I think the website should tell you what you need to know. And we're excited to uh, get to meet more of our listeners. It's been cool to actually get to yeah. be involved in our, the education of our listeners. Just last weekend, met several of our listeners, and that's yeah. always kind of weird, but yeah. awesome. It's very cool. You know? Very so, cool. Very humbling. Yeah, it is. So, again, head over to RestoreToDrivenImplants.com. And again, check out the social media for the dental guys. And for John, I'm Wes, and we are the dental guys. <laughs>